put on my glasses because I can't see anything when I take them off. But the reflection is terrible. So anyway, hello everybody. And we've got another great webinar here from Tefl Equity Advocates. And uh, I've got Kevin Hodgson here with me. Hello, hello Kevin. Eric, how are you doing? All right. Good. How are you? Excellent. Thank you. So um, I'm really looking forward to, to this presentation, uh, Demotivating Native uh, Speakerism. And uh, just before we start, I want to thank BELTA, the Belgian English Language Teaching Association, uh, that's made this webinar series possible. And so I want to thank them for um, lending me the, the webinar room and making this series of webinar happen. So if you're around in, in Belgium, come, come to the conference in April. And they've also got uh, webinars. And you can find more about their webinars and what they do on BeltaBelgium.com. So, um, the floor, the virtual floor is yours, Kevin. I'll uh, just disappear and really looking forward to this presentation. Okay. Well, hello, everyone, and I thank you all for coming on this uh, Sunday. And um, I'd also like to give a big thank you to Merrick, not only for producing this, but also for all of the work, uh, the time he's given to raising awareness about native speakers and related issues. Okay. So today I'll give you a brief outline about what I was planning to talk about. Um, I wanted to focus on my research, two studies I've done, but I, I don't want this to be a lecture style. I'd like to, to be more of a seminar style. So I was hoping to sandwich my research with, with feedback from you. But I think first it's important to, to just review and clarify some, some terms that we'll be using a lot today. Um, the first of which is, is the term itself, native speakerism. Um, I'm going to make two assumptions. The first assumption is that uh, perhaps most of you are aware of this term, and that's what brought you here. But I'm also going to assume that perhaps somebody here may not be as familiar with the term. So if the first group can just bear with me for a few minutes, I'd just like to review uh, the concept of native speakerism itself. <laughs> Looking at this, this quote, um, it may seem shocking to some people, perhaps because of the language. But uh, to me, it's, uh, what's more shocking about this is, is the date that you see there. Uh, this is a quote. It's, it's uh, the title of a manuscript uh, written back in 1985, which is now 32 years ago. Uh, this uh, manuscript um, is often considered to be the beginning of the dialogue about native speakers. And the, the phrase wasn't coined yet. but it started then. And uh, what is surprising is that now, after three decades, uh, there's still very little awareness about this topic. Um, uh, just as a, an example, um, when I was advertising for this, this webinar, uh, somebody asked me if native speakerism was a term that I had, in fact, made up. So that, I think, indicates how little awareness there is about it. Um, one of the problems is the definition of native speaker itself. Um, for those of you who are familiar with the literature, I'm sure that we could debate this, uh, the, debate the definition for, for over an hour. Uh, one of the problems is that it seems like common sense. Everybody knows what a native speaker is. But if we think about it more, um, we can see that it's, it's much more dynamic. Um, the traditional view of a native speaker in applied linguistics, and I think for the majority of the people in the world, is a person who speaks their mother tongue. It's the, the language that they use at home with their family. It's the language that their teachers teach them at school, the government communicates with them, entertainment, media, all aspects of their lives. Um, and this was the, the traditional view. So for example, a um, native English speaker would be somebody who in a Applied linguistics previously um, were from what we call center nations, such as United Kingdom, uh, United States of America, Canada, uh, Australia, New Zealand. This was the image of a native English speaker. Um, as I said, there are many anomalies to this definition, and I'll just share one personal example, I think, with you. Uh, I'm living here in the United Arab Emirates, and the official language is, is Arabic. Um, the majority of the Emirati, the, the local population, uh, they speak Arabic, a dialect of Arabic, as their first language. 
and English is the subsequent or second language. But last year, I had a, I, I met one student, and um, her English was um, it was amazing. A very high proficiency, complex grammar, wide range of vocabulary, and the pronunciation was was GA was was general American. It's she sounded like anybody in a Hollywood movie or. Uh, like a broadcaster at one of the, the major news networks. And listening to her speak and also knowing that she was she had to take remedial Arabic courses because her, her Arabic skills were not, not really enough to study at the faculty level. So knowing that information and listening to her speak, I, I just assumed that you know she had some extensive experience living overseas. Uh, after asking her though, it turns out she, she had never even been overseas. Uh, she went to, a, a, I believe it was an American curriculum school, a private high school, and her parents used English a lot. Both of her parents were, were Emirati, but uh, they used English at home. It was the home language, it was the language of education, it was the language of uh, all of her entertainment. So how would we classify this person? By the traditional definition, she would not be a native speaker. However, the fact that she was taking remedial Arabic courses I think linguistically, we could say she was not a native speaker in Arabic either. How do you define such people? Personally, I think she, she would be a native speaker. So that's just one example. Um, the seminal works, there's, there's been a lot of literature written on the topic, but most of it has been theoretical. But two of the seminal works that stand out were uh, Philipson's uh, Linguistic Imperialism in 1992, in which he introduced the concept of the native speaker fallacy. Um, that's the idea, the notion that the ideal model for language learners is the native speaker. And by extension, that really the only people who are qualified to teach that are native speakers. But as he indicated, this is a fallacy. Uh, not only because of problems with the definition of native speaker itself, but also there are many advantages that non-native speakers have over native speaking teachers. But the term itself was coined, the native speakerism was coined by Holiday in 2005. <clears throat> okay, so native speakerism is one important part of this presentation, but also psycholinguistics. This is another new field, and the psycho there, of course, refers to psychology, um, not some Norman Bates type of crazy, murderous aspect. Um, this is another new field, and it, it can also be dealt with um, neurology, for example, how processing works in the brain, language processing works in the brain. But for me, my field is not that deep. I'm looking at it more for in the classroom, and I think anybody that's, that's been in a classroom before, or as well as a student, of course, too, you know that there's, you know, there's many variables that can affect how you feel. This is the emotion or the psychology of, of education. Two obvious examples are, are motivation and demotivation, um, what encourages people to learn, what uh, discourages them, um, anxiety, for example, test anxiety, um, empathy, rapport, the teacher-student rapport, all of these can be um, aspects of psycholinguistics. So first, before I continue with this, I'd just like to, to ask you out there if anybody has any positive or negative experiences either learning or communicating in a subsequent language. Nothing? Okay, I can see multiple attendees are typing. Okay, we have a terrible language learner, so a bad example. Good experiences, okay.
I hate it when native speakers pitch a nice version of the language because I'm not a native speaker. Okay. So this is uh, this is an example when people change their diction or or slow down perhaps pitch a nice version of the language because I'm not a native speaker. Okay. And that created negative feelings. when your accent is noted in a condescending way. Okay, any examples of, of how? Uh, the one brings me back to the pigeonized version. My wife is also a non-native speaker, and one thing she would complain when we go back to Canada visiting the family was um, how um, if she missed something, how people just start speaking really slowly, saying the exact same thing, not thinking that it was perhaps a choice of vocabulary. A few more people are typing. Commenting, oh, we would never say that, even though there was no grammar mistake in a nonsense utterance. Okay, I've heard teachers where I work use pidgin English, really, in the classroom. Student, sorry. In the corridor. I can see from some of the responses that, um, from all of the responses here, that we can see how uh, our psychology is, is affected positively or negatively by our, our interactions with other people. And so <clears throat> the area that I looked at, because there's a lot of different um, aspects of psycholinguistics, but here I'm looking at self-confidence. Again, it's like native speakerism. It, it's, it's a word that we all know. We all, we all think we know it what it means, we use it every day, but um, again, we can find it maybe a little more dynamic than we think. Um, the theoretical basis for my studies are, are these two here, the first of which is Gardner and Lambert, and they're, they're kind of the, the pioneers of uh, psycholinguistics. Um, and this, this really is a, a common sense uh, description. Um, uh, they define it as a high interrelation between anxiety as an effective aspect and self-proficiency as a cognitive component. Um, in short, what this means is the more comfortable you feel or the less anxiety you have um, coupled with your impression, your self-evaluation determines how you feel. So, for example, if you look at the equation in the middle, a low foreign language anxiety, a person who's comfortable, they don't have any stress or anxiety when they're communicating, they feel comfortable in the language, plus uh, high evaluations of language performance, perhaps they've got high TEFL scores or IELTS scores. Combination of the two, they'll have high linguistic self-confidence. Uh, Conversely, uh, somebody who feels anxious when they're communicating and they don't have good self-evaluation will have low uh, self-confidence, linguistic self-confidence. Again, I think this is this is common sense. This we could apply to anything, sports or whatever we're doing. But it's the, the second um, uh, person here, Norton. They took this and expanded it into a social constructivist view, which is to say, it's not the first part. Gardner Lambert is just what's going on in our heads. Okay, that's the, the inner psychology. With Norton, it's from the outside, it's what uh, our family, society, uh, the media. Like for example here, some of the examples, it was what other people said. That's from the outside affecting you. Um, another good example that I can think of is um, from, from Canada, my home country, um, perhaps the motivation or demotivation of, of the children of immigrants to, to study their, their parents' mother tongue. This can be affected, uh, regardless of whatever the parents are doing, by 
the way the society or their peers at school view their language and culture. There have been studies on this that have shown that, for example, if the study, if the, you know, the general population that they're exposed to, their peers and whatnot at school, have uh, a valorization or high views of their, their language and culture, it'll motivate the children to study it more. Whereas if it's ignored or if there's negative views, it could be demotivating. This is one example. So for myself, with my, my research, I wanted to see how native speakerism, the ideas of native speakerism, affect um, the learners and users' linguistic self-confidence. Okay. There, the first research I did was, was in Japan, and it was, it was published in Rauk Journal uh, now two years ago. It doesn't feel like that long ago, but it was. Um, Quick background, at the time I was working for a Japanese company. Um, I, I worked for the Human Resources Department and I uh, had a split job of half the time I was working doing office work uh, related to English, either proofreading or translating. And the other time I was uh, teaching uh, employees either individually or in a group. Anyway, but when I was uh, doing the research, I, I noticed after a while, sorry, when I was working there, I, I noticed that um, so all of the people I taught were either, they either had been uh, on overseas work experiences or were doing it, or they were going to be doing it in the future. They were being prepared to, to live or work overseas. And I noticed that um, most of the, the employees who had the overseas work experience, they had different views. They were saying things to me that, that I was reading in the literature about native speakerism. None of these people knew uh, the term native speakerism, and uh, none of them had read any of the literature, of course, but they were saying things that were in agreement with, with what the applied linguists were writing about. So that gave me the idea to, to, do a, to do a study to see if that overseas work experience was affecting um, their views and their impressions. The two research questions, uh, the first one, is, is related to that. This is the uh, qualitative part of the research. Uh, does experience working in international contexts influence non-native speakers' beliefs to native speaker norms? And then the related question was, do these beliefs affect their linguistic self-confidence? Uh, the second part, um, I must admit that I, I had a bit of an agenda when I was doing this. As I mentioned before, uh, I noticed that a lot of the literature on native speakerism was was mostly theoretical, so I wanted to do to do a solid study. It was both qualitative and quantitative. Um, so the second part was to address the the, the um, quantitative aspect, and that was: is there a correlation between the non-native speaker's English proficiency and belief in native speaker norms? And then, of course, did that. Uh, affect the proficiency, did it affect uh, linguistic self-confidence? I'm not going to talk much about the second point because unfortunately there was, um, the results were inconclusive, but I, I suppose that means uh, it, was, it was a good study, I hope, anyway. Um, of course, part B, part B there, was, um, there was a correlation. The higher uh, scores they had, um, the more linguistic self-confidence they had. That, I think, was to be expected. But with regard to the, um, the proficiency level and belief in native speaker norms, there was no, it was, it was inconclusive. There were a few outliers, but I, I don't think it discredited the study. And um, uh, for reasons I, I won't go into in depth here, but I, there will always be some people who, who want to be perfectionists, and their reasons are, of course, their own. And um, that's fine. Um, so the data collection, the, the qualitative part was a questionnaire uh, that I gave to 83 participants. And um, after that, I interviewed them. I could only get 79 for interviews, though. Um, and I focused on the questionnaire. Of course, I had many questions, background questions. But there were three questions in particular that I focused on in the interview. And the qualitative part was to take their TOEIC scores. Um, the company that I was working for at the time would test the employees would talk twice a year, so I was able to get those results. Okay, looking at the results, um, I think this graph, I hope this graph is, is easy to see. Um, 
there's three columns. The first is all the participants, all 79. The second is anyone with overseas work experience, whether it's short term or long term. So short term could just be going on a business trip for a weekend, which uh, in many, anybody who's worked in Japan will know that oftentimes they will. They'll fly out to Dubai just for a meeting and go right back. And long term would be living, living in another country. And the last um, one there is, is anybody who's only lived overseas. And at this company, they would work for one, three, or five years. And as we can see, uh, the purple is very important, blue is important, uh, orange not important, and yellow not important at all. Sorry, I forgot to say the question. Of course, the question is how important did they feel it was to be a native speaker? So very important would be they really want to, to speak like a native speaker. But looking at this, even at a quick glance, we can see that the more work experience they had internationally, um, it decreased they're 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 wanting to speak like a native speaker. We went from uh, forty six percent with seven percent saying it's very important from all participants, right down to only twenty five percent. So I think this was clear. Uh, but what made it even um, clear was was the interview, of course, afterwards. Um, I found another big difference between the people who had worked overseas and those who did not was the depth. Uh, of, the, of their replies. Um, the people who had worked overseas would give much deeper, and I would say more professional reasons. Um, like for example, the ones who still thought, out of the 25% here who thought it was still important to speak like a native speaker, the ones who had lived overseas uh, would uh, say comments such as the following. Uh, there was one person, for example, who said uh, that for his job he has to have dinner and have drinks with, uh, with his American colleagues, and uh, when he goes out, it's important to communicate with them, to get the jokes, to join in. He said, because if I can communicate well with them at these social events, it will help our business. Conversely, um, for example, uh, a reason given from all participants, somebody who had not lived overseas, was uh, that um, they wanted to understand Hollywood movies, or another person said that um, they wanted to feel cool or smart. They said that if they could speak like a native speaker and sound like a native speaker, the people around them would think they were cool or smart. So we can see that there was a much, um, there was a big difference in, in, in the type of responses they gave as well. Moving on to the next question, it's similar, um, but it's should non-native speakers learn all forms of native speakers English for international communication, and, and the keyword is for the international communication there. Again, all forms, so here we mean should they learn all the colloquial expressions, slang, all of that. And again, we see a similar pattern. The more overseas work experience, um, it increases, um, it decreases the, the native speaker's beliefs. And again, um, the, from the interviews, I could get more deeply, um, um, deeply, D deeper reasons. Um, for example, um, one person who had overseas work experience, he mentioned that uh, of this company, by the way, I should mention that they have factories and in, in, in factories and offices all over the world. But uh, the factories in China and Thailand, for example, he visits. He visits um, most of the engineers and staff there. They'll, they'll speak Japanese, and he mentioned that when he goes there and speaks Japanese to them. He always carefully chooses to speak the standard Japanese dialect, and he says he always carefully chooses his words in order for them to understand. And he made the point that native English speakers should do the same when they communicate. They should speak a standard one that everybody understands. I'm sorry, I see some questions here. What in this case was speaking like a native speaker to mean? It was pure competence, communicative competence that is defined as something more. Um, okay, I'm going to assume that this is the next, the, this one? I assume figure two. Uh, yes, speaking like a native speaker, so that would be here. It means using colloquial forms, all forms of English, non-standard, standard, standard uh, contractions, slang. Should they learn everything? I'm not sure if I, I answered the question correctly. Perhaps, Gary, you can tell me if I did or not. Okay, 
And the last question that we looked at was um, how they feel. This is regarding the linguistic um, self-confidence. So again, no, if you'll notice, nobody answered. There was, there was another one for very comfortable. Nobody answered very comfortable. But we can see that the more overseas work experience they had, they felt more comfortable. We went from only 37% among all participants to 63 to 75%. And one of, again, one of the, there were different reasons for this, and the interviews, of course, always tell us a lot more than, than we're getting just from the statistics. Um, with regard to native speakers, one of the participants mentioned that he felt a lot more comfortable after going overseas because he noticed that native speakers sometimes had communication problems, and he gave the example of an American and an Australian. He said after noticing these two having communication problems, he felt a lot more self-esteem uh, and a lot more confident about his own skills. But surprisingly, um, one of the biggest reasons for changing their thinking was uh, non-native speakers. I think as we know right now, there's, there's more non-native speakers than native speakers in the world at present. And for a lot of uh, English language learners, a lot of them, large majority, will communicate more with other non-native speakers than with native speakers. And one of my participants, uh, he, he, was an, um, he was actually the manager of overseas sales, and he pointed out that prior to, to going on, on the business trips, he always felt, um, felt nervous. He was worried about making mistakes. He, he felt inhibited, especially when speaking with native speakers. But then they said after he went overseas, he, would, uh, he, he was speaking with people, you know, Thai, Chinese, French, Spanish, people from all over the world, and he said, you would notice that they make grammatical mistakes, they made pronunciation mistakes, they made mistakes, and uh, he realized it was okay to do that, and the most important point was, was the communication. And after experiencing that, he, it, it, it uh, increased his uh, self-confidence, even with native speakers. Okay, that was the first study, and um, at the end, in the conclusion to the first study, um, I noticed that the overseas work experience, it, it changed the, the participants. It uh, made them more self-confident, um, greater self-esteem, and they, they stopped, um, they had actually some negative feelings about the, the native speaker ideals or native speaker's beliefs. So one thing I tried to think about was, well, how can we uh, duplicate this in the classroom? I mean, if this, this it has this effect, what can we do? as teachers. Of course, we can't, we can't just send our students and make them work overseas. We have to do something in the class. So one thing I suggested was perhaps, perhaps we could teach them about native speakers and teach them about the, the, the concepts, what it is, and uh, see if that has any effect. So that was my, the genesis of the second research. And this I did it just before I left Japan and just uh, right after I came to the UAE. So it was a cross-cultural study as well. Uh, the participants, eight were Japanese, uh, they were new recruits in the company, the same company from the previous study, and the UA was 10, 10 university students. Okay. There was only one research question for this one, and it was, does instruction about native speakerism affect students' attitudes towards native speaker norms and or increase linguistic self-confidence? So what I did was, um, over two classes, at the end of one class, the very end of one class, I just gave them a questionnaire. And the questionnaire was uh, bilingual, in Japanese and English, and Arabic and English. And um, I asked a lot of general questions. Of course, have they heard of the term native speakerism? And a lot of the, the questions were similar to the last study. But that's it, just gave them the questionnaire. In the second class, I, um, I gave a short lecture on native speakerism, and I focused on... Um, Vivian Cook's article, um, I believe it's called Going Beyond the Native Speaker. It's published in 1999, I think, Tessel Quarterly. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with Vivian, Vivian Cook, he's, um, well, first of all, he, it's, it, Vivian is a he, and um, he's, he's a very witty, very, very excellent writer. And he, it's a theoretical work. He proves uh, he provides a lot of arguments against native speakerism, but he does it in in a, in a witty and entertaining way. So I um, I just summarized the the article for them, and then after I gave them another questionnaire, which was quite similar, of course, to the the first one. 
And the results of that, first, uh, about the proficiency goal. Do they want to speak like a native speaker? Okay, and here I think, Gary, now I'm, I'm understanding what your question is, speaking native, a native speaker. Um, again, going back to the beginning, it's what, it's what the, the people perceive a native speaker to be. So this, this of course, is, is how they interpret it. Um, and I, I can't get inside the head of every participant, but I do know that they were not aware of the concept, and I, I can only assume that their, their image of a native speaker would be what the, the traditional version was, as uh, somebody coming from uh, Carchus's, uh, Carchus's uh, inner, inner nations, inter uh, countries, sorry. Okay, but going back to the results here for proficiency goal, we'll see that um, with Japan there was there was mostly no change. Only one person changed their opinion of their goal, what they wanted to be. But um, with the UAE, uh, six people changed. Okay, I think one one reason perhaps for this and we have to remember is in the in the Japan case. Um, they were all graduates, university graduates. They were already working for a company, an international company. In the UAE case, that um, um, in the UAE case, it was they were university students. Okay, I'm sorry. This this slide somehow got a little uh, messed up uh, going up here, but uh, we can see the change from Japan. It was just one person. They went from a native speaker to near native speaker. The categories were native speaker, near native speaker, full professional independence. And again, th these were all translated both in Arabic and, and Japanese, so there was no misunderstanding. By full professional independence, we mean um, being able to work in any, in, in any environment without any assistance. Okay? But we can see from the beginning, only one of them really wanted to speak like a native speaker. And there was one change. In the UAE case, Again, it's a little messed up, but there were six changes. They went from native speaker to near native, and I believe, I believe that's five. Five went from native speaker to full professional independence, and one from near native to uh, full professional independence. Still, there were some no changes. Two, two of them still wished and wanted to speak like a native speaker. The second question is, how important is it to communicate like a native speaker? Okay. This we see the biggest differences. In both cases, um, six people changed their, their view. In Japan, they went from, uh, two people went from very important to important, uh, one from very important to not very important, I believe that's supposed to be, and three went from important to not very important. And still there were some no changes. For example, one still thought it was important and one thought it was not very important. In the UAE case, um, six people changed from very important to important. Okay? And some of the reasons that were, were given here um, for this, uh, I remember, uh, unfortunately, there weren't always comments on these questionnaires, which is one of the advantages to doing interviews after. But uh, one, one of the participants in the UAE case had mentioned that um, after thinking about it and reflecting, um, they thought they they, they thought they were more confident and they, they wished that maybe native speakers could realize that about them when they speak. But the biggest one here is about linguistic self-confidence, how they feel after learning about native speakerism. Looking at Japan, we can see that 50% said they felt much more confident and 25% a little more confident. So that's 75% change for, for more positive um, self-confidence. And again, it's duplicated pretty much here in the UAE. 40% um, felt much more confident, and 40% said they felt a little more confident, which is still 80% change for positive. The last question I just uh, I just wanted to see out of curiosity, you know, I asked them directly, should we should we teach this? Should we teach this to students? In both groups, the majority said yes, but in in both groups there was one person who said no, and I, I, st I could never find out why they didn't write any comments. I suppose in, in reflection, uh, it would have been better to follow up this study with interviews as well. Okay, um, 
I'd like to end it with some discussion here, but I, I would like to make one co final comment about the second study. Um, again, it was, it was small scale, and like all research, I, I guess I could say that one of the limitations of my study was, was the scope, and perhaps more research should be done on this. But um, I think at least my study shows that native speakerism is having some affect, uh, psycholinguistic affect on students. And if by teaching them about it, if talking about it, if introducing them to the topic and, and debating, discussing it with them, if it can, can help them be something positive for them, why, why don't we do it? Why, um, why do we keep uh, these topics, I guess this is under the umbrella of critical pedagogy, why do we keep this just at conferences or at webinars like this? Why, why don't we teach it explicitly, directly to students, if it, if it can have any positive affect on them and make them feel better about themselves and motivate them and maybe change their attitudes? Um, so that's my final comment about the second study. I'd like to hear your feedback about that too. And um, I'm not sure of the, the time that we'll have left. I have a few discussion questions, but I'd, I'd like to focus on the third one if we could. It's related to, to what I was just speaking about. Um, other methods of reducing negative affect. So I'd like to ask you, should we, should we teach this concept to the students, uh, language learners? Um, and are there any other methods that we, at the beginning I asked you if you had any, any experiences, negative or positive experiences uh, with uh, learning a language. And I heard quite a lot of, there was mostly negative back. What can we do to help reduce this as, as educators in language learning? How can we reduce negative affect? And I'm sorry, I haven't been, uh, my eye has been, I've been noticed people have been writing. I guess this is, so I'll try to go back here too. Yes, yes. I think, yeah, Gary, your comment there about um, native speakers, this is, it is, it's an idealized form. Um, I mean, anybody that, we know in our own languages that um, not everybody speaks grammatically accurately all the time, and uh, again, vocabulary range, all of this. But yes, for I think a lot of, uh, a lot of people, uh, perhaps they think of the, the native speakers. I know in Japan, one of the, the biggest examples was they were always scared of making mistakes in front of uh, native speakers. This, this could have something to do with the education system and well, a lot of other variables. But yeah, there's this idea that if you speak like a native speaker, you're, you're speaking perfectly and not making any mistakes. I always emphasize speaking English at the beginning, and after a while, they should work on their accent. Okay, as a way to reduce the uh, and uh, Merrick, thank you for 25 minutes. Okay, probably less now. Okay. Yeah. So this is, I think, it's one of the um, going back to the very beginning of this is is the definition itself. It's the definition is, is problematic, and then of course people's interpretations of that. Um, it has a negative effect. Teaching students about connected speech help them understand it's not all about grammatical accuracy, yes. Okay. And there's also you know, the, the whole uh, dichotomy between fluency and accuracy, right? I noticed another, just in, in my experience, and you can please tell me yours, uh, that um, there's, there's a lot, and I have one student like this right now, there's a lot of students who feel that speaking fast, really quickly, somehow is, is, is preferable. It's, it's what sounds like a native speaker. But fluency, as we know, is, is, not, um, is not just about speed. Hmm. 
maybe for some speed is effective, not for students. Okay. Yeah, at times. Um, I, I mentioned one student I have now. Right now I'm teaching a communication skills class which focuses on presentation and there's this one girl, she's she's incredibly fluent, amazing speaker, but she's speaking too fast all the time in, in the presentations. When I speak too fast they say, come again please. I did it while I was myself an intermediate level speaker, therefore thereafter I figured out that I was doing this in order to avoid pronunciation mistakes. Now I teach my students that speed doesn't hide your mistakes. You see there's there's a lot of typing. I was just wondering if we could um, speak slow. I was wondering if, if we had any, any ways, though, to reduce negative affect. How do, how do you all feel about um, teaching? these topics directly to students or do, do any of you do any of you discuss this with your students about native speakers and native speakers beliefs Yeah, maybe bringing, so other non-native speakers, one or two interested her. Yeah. In, in, um, yeah, depends on the age of the students. In my, the last job I had, I was lucky to have um, a room to, to teach the students into myself. It was actually half a storage, and it was half a storeroom and half my, 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 language room. But what I did, since all my students were Japanese, I put pictures on the wall of, of famous Japanese people who were using English in international contexts. These would be some uh, scientists and of course some Hollywood stars, and at the time it was Ken Watanabe. I put these pictures up and then I would, um, I would talk to them about the students, ask them why they thought I put those pictures up. And it, it, uh, it would start a, a natural discussion about the topic. Because I think this is, this is one of, in the literature, um, this, this is one of the, the solutions, is that instead of focusing on this idealized native speaker version, we should be looking at successful language learners, um, successful non-native speakers, especially particularly from their, their the same, the same um, language family or culture. People who have gone through the process of learning the language at um, an, an international level successfully. This is really who they should be emulating, um, not some idealized version. Um, the issue is to make them speak English somehow. issue is to make them, yeah, teachers. 
So how do we, we motivate them to, to speak more? I think it's a great idea. Some people have suggested changing the name because any of, any of you that are involved in assessment will notice most of the time when we're assessing these students, a lot of times the rubrics, they'll, they'll put uh, native, they, for the top level, it's native speaker, native-like, near native. We still use these definitions when we're assessing them. And um, a lot of times our assessments of them, we're, we're acting as gatekeepers. A lot of times in order to enter university, you need to take an English language test. To graduate, you need it to, for employment. The last company I was working at tested their employees, um, TOEIC test twice a year. This was used for promotions as well. And if the top, uh, you know, the rubric, if the top part of the rubric says native speaker or native-like, that's um, meaning the best example is an excellent teacher is also on that. Yes, teachers, sorry, I'm bringing to class their interest, okay. That would motivate them, meaning the best example is an excellent teacher who is also a non-native speaker. Um, I don't think it, it always necessarily has to be a non-native speaker. Um, I just meant examples for them, uh, not necessarily teachers. Um, there could be native speakers who, who also have the same qualities, but I just meant as, as a role model, as, 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 a, as an, a model by which the students should try to emulate. I was that's what we like to talk today. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The, well, this is this is one thing too. Myself, I always start the class just just talking to them a bit, building rapport with the students. Okay. I think it would be great for future schools. Really, they the schools ask non-native teachers to hide their nationality. I'm, I'm very sorry to hear that too. Yeah. Now that's that's very discouraging to hear that. I'm sorry. Still, many people are typing. You've been asked to pretend to be many things you weren't. That you were asked to to be a, na a native speaker. Really? Again, but what what is real real English? In Thailand, many students refuse to be taught. Yeah, this is, um, whenever we bring up the topic of native speakers, and there, there's always the one argument that um, it's not what the students want. Right? This is the business side, right? That it's not what the students want. Um, but we, we have to ask, are we, are we a profession or are we an industry? Um, I like to believe working in education. Would would you say that about other teachers, for example? No, you would you would you would take the best person for the job. So again, I think that this. Um, so going back to the very beginning, I think here listening to the comments, not listening, sorry, re reading all of the comments here, it's, it seems everybody here is um, has a lot of knowledge about the subject. But I think this is part of the problem. It's not in the general society yet. And I think thanks to the effort of people like Merrick doing this, we have to to make this out there. Fake clips of internationally intelligible. Yes, yes. That's that's Angus. I think that's that's an excellent idea. Right? Let them let them see clips of people doing it. And especially if it's um People from the, their same background, if, if you could, if you could find the same linguistic background. 
really sell the certificate. Yes, I, I and it saddens me to read some of these comments here. Okay, thank you, Merrick. Excellent. Um, I did have four <laughs> discussion questions on here. It's okay if you'd like to stay with one. Um, if you'd like to talk about the other ones, that's that's fine too. Um, one of the last ones, and I think one way, um, as I said, when I did the first study, I, I really wanted to do something that was qualitative and quantitative, something solid, because I still think now, even though this, this has been discussed for decades now, a lot of the literature is theoretical and I think if we could put more studies out there more statistics um, perhaps it, it it may help um, so I'd also like to know if there's any other future research directions that could be taken because I promise not to steal your ideas I, I already have an idea myself to focus on um, language anxiety for it's for a future idea but how else can we move forward with this with this then? Or perhaps maybe we should try to go outside of of um, just our profession. Bringing the discussion into the classroom and teacher training, yes. Actually, Myself, the, the the reason I became interested in this was was purely by accident. Um, it was during my graduate studies. Um, I became interested in critical pedagogy. Uh, people like Philipson and um, Penny Cook. Um, I just I stumbled into that, and then from there that led to the topic of native speakers. And so yes, it was not something that uh, any of my other classmates were reading about unless they they did it themselves. This was back in two thousand and eight. So that already is eight years ago. I, I don't know um, if anybody is still, if, if any of you are still studying full time in a university, can you tell me, um, is native speakers on um, these issues, are these issues part of the curriculum now? Or are, are, are future applied linguists being taught this? Or do they have to read anything about it? Because this this is one, it, it, it could be part of the, um, part of the course is required reading, at least a section. Talking to the agents and the school directors, yeah. So I guess, Mary, that's okay. Perspectives from... Okay, there's a lot coming at once here. So. Hello? All right. It does not talk as yes. Hello, about native speaker. Yes. So that. No, sir. I just thought I would uh, come on for the last couple of minutes to uh, join the discussion uh, as well. But uh, you're, you're studying right now too. Is is anything? Um, do you know anything in the, in the the university that you're at or the university that you're studying with? Are they they teaching these topics? Is it required reading? I don't. I don't think it is. I think there's a little bit on English as a lingua franca and world Englishes. That's sort of that's entered the sort of the mainstream um, like TESOL courses. But I think um, there's very little on native and non-native speakers in at least in the MA on TESOL in the University of York. I think there's there's very little of that. So I think that you know it is it is slowly I think becoming more mainstream, but I really think as well it should be more present in CELTA and DELTA courses. I don't know if you agree with that because I think that's, you know, what, what we, we, we in, we're in the, a lot of us are in the private sector, in the private ELT sector, and I think this is, you know, where um, most of the teachers, they come from CELTA or DELTA backgrounds, so I think 
that's perhaps an area where you know these topics could be discussed. Well, what do you think, Kevin? No, I, I agree. I think that um, it has to start with with a lot of the teachers and students first, right? Um, well, both, because um, I'm surprised too how um, how few um, my fellow teachers are aware of these topics after all these years, mm. and um, so I, I think it should be in in at least part of it. I, I mean, I, I'd say the same thing about to somebody studying economics. I think somebody that's studying economics it would be assumed that they would at least take one course in comparative economics, right? Mm. I would think here too that if you're if you're going to be training to be a, a, a applied linguist or an English language instructor, that uh, you should take um, some course, and every and then of course everything related to that. You said South. I'm, I'm from Canada, so it's more uh, TEFL and um, IELTS and things like that. That uh, uh, Tesla certification, sorry, but even there too, all, all of this, it, it should be, mm. it should be part of it. I think there should be a discussion about it. I think so. I think I think there should be because, for example, you know, I only stumbled into the topic, you know, sort of by, well, by accident. Well, I was, you know, I applied for a job and I was turned down because because I'm Polish and uh, and that's how I found out about, that this whole thing existed. And I, you know, mm. I'd already taught English for like five or six years maybe then, five years maybe, you know, I, I'd done the Delta and the Celta, I had a BA in English, you know, so I thought of myself as a fairly, you know, interested and qualified teacher, but I had never ever heard about these topics. I had no idea that like, you know, a whole um, research field existed. So, um, you know, that was already, you know, a couple of years ago, but still I think, you know, that's, that's the case very often. That teachers are just not aware of it. No, I agree, and then of course too about those arguments about what's not what the students want. But then there's a bigger task there to to make it more aware outside of our profession as well. And I think with my first study, um, it was interesting, as I mentioned, that the students, uh, a lot of the things they were saying to me was the same thing I was reading. You know, in some paraphrased form, but it was they were they they came to the same conclusions through their work experience. Mm. But unfortunately, these these people are a small segment of the population. Most people are not working for large international companies, going on you know living overseas. They're they're a minority of of people in a population. But um, again, awareness, and that's I bring it back to us teaching again what we can do. Can we bring this up once a term to our students? Uh, in, in my experience, it found that it did. It had a, a, a positive uh, affect on them. And if if it's something's gonna, I think anybody who's a good teacher is gonna try to do everything to make their students, uh, you know, feel better and enjoy and make it a pleasant, make the learning experience pleasant. So, if this can do that, why not do that as well? Why not? Why not try it? Yeah. Nobody in my research said that uh, it had a negative effect on them. You know, it was either made them feel better or just no change. Yeah. Right? And I think it's uh you know it's a very interesting topic for for debate as as it is, I think, you know, like just kind of you know, debating these issues and uh, you know, there's lots of lots of different angles you could take on it and uh, and I think it is interesting and you know there are students come to our classes with all sorts of different misconceptions. Like, you know, they, they think, oh I'll do gap fill exercises and that's how I'm gonna learn English or I don't know there are a lot of different misconceptions that people might have about learning languages and we are not mm -hmm. afraid to to sort of to debunk them or talk them out of it so I can't see why we shouldn't talk about this topic either and you know at the end of the day if you know your students still feel that they definitely prefer a native speaker model then well that's the at least they've made an informed choice you know and yes yes yeah. Um, and then here, Gary's comment too about um, learning a second language. Again, I think this is an important point when we're we're talking about um, ESL, EFL, whatever one you want to call it. Uh, English is one part. It's that's you know about the language, the grammar, the vocabulary, the teaching methods. That's one part. But the other part is uh, language, uh, second language acquisition, 
right, the process of, of learning a language, which includes a psychological perspective, I think, as well. And that's, that's a big factor that we think, I think we should never separate from, from the teaching. Yeah, absolutely. But then, you know, at the same time, um, I, I understand where Gary is coming from, but uh, I'm actually just about to publish a, a paper with a friend about it where, you know, there's a, there are a lot of stereotypes have been created about native speakers and non-native speakers. So, um, for example, as a non-native speaker, I should be better able to understand my students because I've gone through the same process. But I'm not really sure if I can because I'm quite a quick language learner. I, I don't really find languages difficult. Um, you know, I do have to study a lot to learn them, but, you know, I learn them relatively fast. So I, I find it difficult to empathize with, for example, students who struggle to, to do it. And then I'm writing this paper with a, a you know, a, a British um, teacher, and he's teaching in Japan. And, uh, you know, he's, he's struggling to learn Japanese. And, and he said that this struggle has really helped him to understand his learners, you know. So I think, uh, you know, that's, that's also an, an important point that, uh, you know, sometimes these, the, the, the stereotypes really, and sometimes I'm not sure if they help the discussion. Well, I think that just points out too that what we call classify what is a good teacher, there's so many variables there. Personality traits, learning styles, experience, mm -hmm. it all comes into play, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, definitely. And I think it's and I think it's it's so simplistic to, you know, in EOT that everything, you know, has been just brought down to one category, whether you're a native speaker or not. Yeah. Nativeness, yes. Yeah. So I think yeah, that just reinforces it. There's there's so many variables to, to judge. And again, with each learner too, there's mm. Yeah. Yeah, so perhaps I mean one of the future research direction is perhaps talking about good teaching in general or effective teaching rather, you know, regardless of, um, you know, your nativeness or, or lack of it.